Welcome everyone to theCUBE's presentation of the AWS Startup Showcase, Open Cloud Innovations. This is season two of the ongoing series. We're covering exciting star, uh, startups in the AWS ecosystem to talk about open source community stuff. I'm your host, Dave Nicholson, and I'm delighted today to have two guests from Weaveworks, Steve George, COO of Weaveworks, and Steve Waterworth, technical marketing engineer from Weaveworks. Welcome gentlemen, how are you? Very well, thanks. Very well, thanks very much. So Steve G, what's what's the relationship with AWS? This is the AWS Startup Showcase. How do Weaveworks and AWS interact? Yeah, sure. So um, AWS is a um, investor in Weaveworks and we actually collaborate really closely around EKS and some specific EKS tooling. So in the early days of Kubernetes, when AWS was working on EKS, the Elastic Kubernetes service, um, we started working on the command line interface for EKS itself. Um, and due to that partnership, and we've been working closely with the EKS team for a long period of time, uh, helping them to build the CLI and make sure that users in the community find EKS really easy to use. Um, and so that brought us together with the AWS team working on GitOps and thinking about how to deploy applications and clusters using this GitOps approach. And we built that into the EKS CLI, which is an open source tool. It's a project on GitHub. So everybody can uh, you know, get involved with that, use it, contribute to it. We love hearing user feedback about how to help teams take advantage of the elastic nature of Kubernetes as simply and easily as possible. Well, it's, it's great to have you. Uh, before we get into the specifics around what Weaveworks is doing in this area that we're about to discuss, let's talk about this concept of, uh, of GitOps. Uh, you know, some of us may have, uh, may have gotten too deep into a Netflix series and we didn't realize that we've moved on from the world of uh, DevOps or DevSecOps and the like. Explain where GitOps fits into this evolution. Yeah, sure. Um, so really, GitOps is an instantiation, a version of DevOps, and it fits within the idea that in particularly in the Kubernetes world, we have a model in Kubernetes, which tells us exactly what we want to deploy. And so what we're talking about is using Git as a way of recording what we want to be in the runtime environment and then um, telling Kubernetes from the configuration that is stored in Git exactly what we want to deploy. So in a sense, it's, a it's very much aligned with DevOps because we know we want to bring teams together, help them to deploy their applications, their clusters, their environments. And really with GitOps, we have a specific set of tools that we can use and obviously what's nice about Git is it's a very developer tool or lots and lots of developers use it, the vast majority. Um, and so what we're trying to do is bring those operational processes into the way that developers work. So really bringing DevOps to that generation through that specific tool. So Steve G, let's continue down this thread a little bit. Uh, why is it necessary then this, this, uh, this sort of added wrinkle um, if, you know, if, if right now in my organization, we have developers who consider themselves to be uh, dev apps, DevOps folks, and, uh, and we, yep. give them, we give them Amazon gift cards each month, and we say, right. hey, it's, uh, hey, it's a world of serverless, no code, low code, lights out data centers, uh, go out and deploy your code. Everything should be fine. Uh, what, what's the problem with that model, and how, how, does, how does GitOps come in and address that? Right, I think there's a couple of things. So for individual developers, one of the big challenges is that when you watch development teams like deploying applications and running them, you watch them switching between all, all those different tabs and services and systems that they're using. So GitOps has a real advantage to developers because they're already sat in Git, they're already using their familiar tooling. And so by bringing operations within their developer tooling, you're giving them that familiarity so I think that's one advantage for developers. And then for operation staff, one of the things that it does is it centralizes where all of this configuration is kept 
And then you can use things like templating and some of the things that we're going to be talking about today to make sure that you automate and go quickly, but you also do that in a way which is reliable and secure and stable. So it's really helping to bring that, you know, run fast, but don't break things kind of um, ethos uh, to how we can deploy and run applications in the cloud. So Steve W., let's start talking about where Weaveworks comes into the picture. And uh, uh, what's the, what's your perspective? So yeah, Weaveworks is, has a, an engine, a set of software that enables this to happen. So if you think of it as a, as a constant reconciliation engine. So you've got your, your declared state, you know, you, the, your desired state is declared in Git. So this is where all your YAML for all your Kubernetes hangs out. And then you have an agent that's running inside Kubernetes. That's the that's the Weaveworks uh, GitOps agent, and it's constantly comparing the desired state in Git with the actual state, which is what's running in Kubernetes. So then, as a developer, you want to make a change, or or an operator, you want to make a change. You push a change into Git. The reconciliation loop runs and says, "All ah, right, what we've got in Git does not match what we've got in Kubernetes. Therefore, I will create store a resource whatever." But it also works the other way. So if someone does directly access Kubernetes and make a change, then the next time that reconciliation loop runs, it's automatically reverted back to that single source of truth in Git. So your Kubernetes cluster, you, you don't get any configuration drift. It's always configured as you desire it to be configured. And as Steve uh, George has already said, from a developer or engineer point of view, it's it's easy to use. They're just using Git just as they always have done and continue to do. There's nothing new to learn, no change to working practices. I just push code into Git, magic happens. So so Steve W, little little uh, deeper dive on that. Um, when we when we hear ops, uh, a lot of us start thinking about specifically in terms of infrastructure, uh, and uh, especially since infrastructure can can uh, when deployed and, and and left out there, even though it's really idle, you're paying for it. So, so many times there, anytime there's an ops component to the discussion, cost and resource management uh, come into play. Uh, you mentioned this idea of not letting things drift from a template. W what are those templates based on? Are they based on, uh, is, is, this, is this primarily an infrastructure discussion or are we talking about the code itself that is outside of the infrastructure discussion? It's predominantly around the infrastructure. So what you're managing in Git, as far as Kubernetes is concerned, is all those deployment files and services and horizontal pod autoscalers, all those Kubernetes entities. Typically the source code for your application be it in Java, Node.js, whatever it is you happen to be writing it in, that's typically in a separate repository. Uh, you typically don't combine the two. So you've got one set of repository for, for basically for building your containers and your CI will run off that and ultimately push a container into a registry somewhere. And then you have a separate repo, which is your config repo, which declares you know, what version of the containers you're going to run, how many you're going to run, how the services are bound to those containers, et cetera. Yeah, that makes sense. Steve G. Talk to us about this concept of trusted application delivery right, with right. GitOps. And frankly, it was, uh, it was it, it's what led to the sort of prior question. When you think about trusted application delivery, uh, you know, where is that intertwinement between what we think, what we think of as the application code uh, versus the code that is creating the infrastructure? So what is trusted application delivery? Sure. So. So with GitOps, we have the ability to deploy the infrastructure components, and then we also define what the application containers are that would are going to be deployed into that environment. And so, the, you know, this is a really interesting question because some teams will associate all of the services that an application needs within an application team. And sometimes teams will deploy sort of horizontal infrastructure, which then all application teams uh, services take advantage of. Um, either way, you can you know define that within your your configuration within your GitOps configuration. Um, 
Now, when you start deploying at speed, particularly when you have you know, multiple different teams doing these sorts of deployments, one of the questions that starts to come up will be from the security team or someone who's thinking about, well, what happens if we make a deployment which is accidentally incorrect or if there is a security issue in one of those dependencies and we need to you know, get a new version deployed as quickly as possible. And so in the GitOps pipeline, one of the things that we can do is to put in um, various checkpoints to check that the policy is being followed correctly. So um, are we deploying the right number of applications, the right configuration of an application? Does that application follow certain standards that the enterprise has set down? And that's what we talk about when we talk about trusted policy um, and trusted delivery, because really what we're, we're thinking about here is enabling the development teams to go as quickly as possible with their new deployments, but protecting them with automated guardrails. So making sure that they can go fast but they're not um, you know, going to do anything which destroys the reliability of the application platform. Yeah, well, you mentioned reliability and uh, kind of alluded to scalability in the application environment. Um, what about looking at this from the security perspective? There've been some recently yeah. pretty well pu publicized breaches. Uh, not a lot of senior executives in enterprises understand that a very high percentage of code that their businesses are running on is coming out of the open source community where developers and maintainers are to a certain degree uh, what they would consider to be volunteers. Uh, okay. That can be a scary thing. So, so talk about why an enterprise struggles today with security and policy and governance. And, and, I, and I toss this out to Steve W or Steve George, you know, answer, answer uh, appropriately. Let me, I'll try the, the high level and Steve W can give more of the technical detail. I mean, I'll say that when I talk to enterprise customers, there's sort of, there's two areas of concern. One area of concern is that, you know, we, we're in an environment with DevOps where we started this conversation of trying to help teams do as quickly as possible. But there's many instances where teams accidentally do things, but nonetheless, that is a security issue. They deploy something manually into an environment, they you know, forget about it, and that's something which is wrong. So helping with this kind of policy as code pipeline, ensuring that everything goes through a set of standards can really help teams. And that's why we call it developer guardrails, because this is about helping the development team by providing automation around the outside that helps them to go faster and relieves them from that mental concern of have they made any mistakes or errors. So that's one form. And then the other form is the form where you were going, Dave, which is really around security, dependencies within software, um, you know, a whole um, supply chain of, of um, concern. And what we can do there by, again, having a set of standard uh, scanners and policy checking, and which ensures that everything is checked before it goes into the environment, um, that really helps to make sure that there are no security issues in the runtime deployment. Steve W, do you anything I missed there? Yeah, well, I'll just say, I'll just go a little deeper on the, on the technology there. So essentially we have a library of policies which get you started. Of course, you can modify those policies, write your own, that uh, the library's there just to, just to get you going. So as a change is made, then via, uh, typically via say a GitHub action, the, uh, the policy engine then kicks in and checks all those deployment files and uh, all those, all the YAML for, for Kubernetes and looks for, for things that are then outside of policy. And if that's the case, then the action will fail and you and you won't, that'll show up on the on the pull request. So things like uh, are, are, are your containers coming from trusted sources? You know, it's not just a you're not just pulling in some random container from a from a public registry, you're actually using a trusted registry. Uh, things they are containers running as root or are they running in privileged mode, which again, it could be a, a security, but it's not just about security. It can also be about coding standards. Are the containers correctly annotated? Is the deployment correctly annotated? Does it all have the annotation fields that we require for our coding standards? And it can also be about reliability. Does the deployment script uh, have health, you know, have, have the health checks defined? Does it have a, a suitable replica count? So if you can, so we're a rolling update will actually do a rolling update. You can't do a rolling update with only one replica. 
So you can have all these sorts of checks and guards in there. And then finally, there's an admission controller that runs inside Kubernetes. So if someone does try and squeeze through and, uh, and do something a little naughty and go directly to the cluster, it's not going to happen because that admission controller is going to say, hey, no, that's a policy violation. I'm not letting that in. So it really just stops. It's not. It, it stops developers making mistakes. I know. I know. I've done development and I've deployed things into into Kubernetes and uh, haven't got the config quite right, and then it falls flat in its face, and you're sitting there scratching your head. And with the with the policy checks, then that wouldn't happen because you would try and put something in that has a, a slightly iffy configuration, and it would spit it straight back out at you. So. Obviously, you have some sort of policy engine that you're that you that you're relying on. What is the what is the user experience like? I mean, is this uh, is this a screen that is reminiscent of the Matrix with uh, non-readable characters streaming down that only uh, only another machine can understand? What, what does this look like to the uh, uh, to the operator? Yeah, sure. So we we have a, a console, a web console, where you know developers and operators can um, use a set of predefined policies, and so that's the starting point. And we have a set of you know recommendations there and policies that you can just attach to your deployments. So a set of recommendations about different AWS resources, deployment types, EKS deployment types, uh, you know different sets of standards that your uh, enterprise might be following along with. So that's one way of doing it. And then you can take those policies and start customizing them to your needs. And by using GitOps, what we're aiming for here is to bring both the application configuration, the environment configuration. We talked about this earlier, you know, all of this being within Git, we're adding these policies within Git as well. So for advanced users, they'll have everything that they need together in a single unit of change your application, your definitions of how you want to run this application and service, and the policies that you want it to follow all together in Git. Um, and then when there is some sort of policy violation on the other end of the pipeline, uh, people can see you know, where this policy is being violated, how it was violated. Um, and then for a set of those, you know, we try and automate by showing a pull request for the user about how they can fix this policy violation to try and make it as simple as possible because you know many of these sorts of violations if you're a busy developer there'll be minor configuration details going against the configuration and you just want to fix those really quickly so steve w is that is that uh, what the uh, magalix policy engine is yes that's the to? magalix policy engine so yes it's a saas based Service, uh, it, it holds all the all the it holds the actual policy engine and the and your library of policies. So when your GitHub action runs, it goes essentially makes a, a call across uh, with um, with the configuration and does the does the check and spits out any violation errors if there are any. So folks in this community really like to try things before they deploy them. Uh, uh, is is there an opportunity for people to uh, get a demo of this, get their hands on it? What, what's the best What's the best way to do that? Oh, the best way to do it is have a play with it. Uh, as, as an engineer, I, I just love getting my hands dirty with these sorts of things. So yeah, you can go to to, uh, to the Magalix website and get a thirty day free trial. Uh, you just you know spin yourself up a little test cluster and and have a play. So what? What's coming next? We uh, we had DevOps and then DevSecOps and uh, now GitOps. What's what's next? Are we going to go back to uh, all infrastructure on premises all the time? Back to waterfall. <laughs> back to waterfall. Hot tub time machine. What what's the prediction? Well, I think I think the thing that you set out right at the start actually is the prediction. The difference between infrastructure and applications is steadily going away. Um, uh, you know, as we try and be more dynamic in the way that we deploy. And for us with GitOps, I think we're, you know, there's a lot of, when we talk about operations, there's a lot of depth to what we mean about operations. So I think there's lots of areas to explore how to bring operations into developing developer tooling with GitOps. So that's, I think, uh, you know, certainly where WeaveWorks will be focusing. Well, as an old infrastructure guy myself, uh, I see this as vindication. Uh, because infrastructure still matters, kids. 
<laughs> and we need sophisticated ways to make sure that the proper infrastructure is, is applied. People are shocked to learn that even serverless application environments involve servers. So I tell my 14 year old son this regularly, he, he doesn't believe it, but it is what it is. Steve W, any final thoughts on, uh, on this whole move towards GitOps and specifically the, you know, the Weaveworks secret sauce and superpower? Yeah, it's all about, as we've already said, it's, it's all about going as quickly as possible, but without tripping up, you know, being able to run fast, but without tripping over your shoelaces, which you forgot to tie up. You know, and that's what the automation brings. It allows you to go quickly, does lots of things for you. And uh, yeah, we try and stop you shooting yourself in, your, in the foot as, you, as, you, as you're going. Well, it's been fantastic talking to both of you today. Uh, I'm, uh, I, you know, for the audience's sake, uh, I'm in California and we have a gentleman in France and a gentleman in the UK. It's just the wonders of modern technology never cease. Um, thanks again, Steve Waterworth, Steve George from Weaveworks. Thanks for coming on theCUBE for the AWS Startup Showcase. And to the rest of us, keep it right here for more action on theCUBE, your leader in tech coverage. <laughs>